Welcome to this seventh class of um, managing the small enterprise, which I just call from concept to reality. Um, so because yesterday was Bell's Let's Talk Day talking about mental health, um, last, well, this Tuesday, we talked a lot about just developing mental strength and mental resilience in the face of setbacks, et cetera, et cetera. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It was a bit obviously very intense by some standards, but the point was really, those are the kinds of things that how you react to are going to lead to you being a more successful um, executive and entrepreneur. So today we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to now start talking a little bit more now that we're in a class. It's also easier to talk about some of your projects. So Tuesday evening, um, we had a Zoom call with one group, and they took me through four uh, projects that they were considering. And you know, we kind of had just an open-ended conversation, and then I think we all kind of came to a conclusion that one of those projects made more sense, given a little bit of that framework that we discussed classes one through six, which was what's your comparative advantage, what's the backdrop, you know, what is the world, you know, the technology and the trends, and you know, I mean, obviously, you guys and gals will be in the arena, you have to execute, but I think that was a good way that we took all this philosophy and theory of how to pursue, how to find your purpose and your project, and you applied it. Hopefully, you guys are going to now Go out there and crush it. So today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about marketing technology and product. It's in some ways going to be a very shorter class than the other ones uh, because then we I really actually want to open it up and kind of say I know another group last night emailed me two projects and they want to talk to me privately, which obviously I respect. But if anybody has any kind of questions in general about hey I'm considering A or B, the idea is marketing technology product service today should give you an idea of, yeah, which one should I basically pursue? So in the FAQ, we're going to basically look at the target deliverables. It's very, it's somewhat democratic. I asked you guys, you know, accept or reject. Somebody emailed me with a valid question. I myself noticed something, so we made a small change, but we'll discuss that at the end. And if you guys have any other questions, it's an open forum. So shall we begin? All right. So we've looked at a lot of these pillars so far, some of the conditions for entrepreneurial success, finance and accounting, uh, what is your purpose, which is basically mission, vision, statement of purpose, people culture, which is arguably what really drives long-term value creation. Um, so marketing, marketing is really, I call it more goodwill. Goodwill with a capital G, anybody knows what goodwill stands for in accounting? It's basically your brand equity. You know, the reason why some of you will pay six, seven dollars for a cappuccino at Starbucks instead of a dollar fifty at the local cafe, it's goodwill. It's the branding. You know, that's basically what it is. Um, and goodwill is really, really important. You build up your reputation. You know, it takes decades to build your reputation. You could lose it in an instant. So marketing, uh, I'm sure some of you guys have taken these classes, really incorporates all of the following public relations, advertising, these days more and more social media. Also, to some extent, investor relations and lobbying. Now, investor relations kind of is the, it's actually like the love child of finance and marketing, but they're very much, you know, it's very important. Um, and lobbying is kind of like business affairs, legal and marketing. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Apple, they spend tens of millions of dollars a year in terms of lobbying. They got big presences in DC and the States. Brussels in the EU, Ottawa, um, a few years ago, kind of funny, um, Google, our contacts at YouTube, asked me if I wanted to go speak at a CRTC event in Vancouver, and the CRTC is obviously kind of very, it's a more traditional organization that kind of oversees telecommunications and media, and the internet has kind of been left alone, right? So it's kind of that will change over time. Whenever there's a nascent industry over time, it's it's at first it's left alone. It's a wild, wild west. We want innovation. We don't want to hold it back. But then eventually, like adults come in and go, well, wait a minute, you can't market cigarettes to kids. You know, you can't do certain things that seem obvious in hindsight. And so I went there and I kind of gave them, you know, my, my spiel. And it's funny because in later years I saw the CRTC actually use a lot of that jargon in their official. Memorandum. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like, that's, so it echoes to me. But the point is, and that the point is, I got to meet a lot of Google and YouTube's 
effectively lobbyists, very smart people, very well connected, you know, and it was interesting just to see that machine, um, and it's, it's really important, and again, it's half marketing, half business affairs. So marketing is a really cool field. I think a lot of people like it. It's a bit like psychology and management organizational behavior. It basically explains a lot of what we do. Um, I didn't include, oh no, I did. Advertising is the sexy part of marketing, you know, Super Bowl ads and all that. Um, but there's a lot of things in the trenches, a lot of blocking and tackling that go into it. But the reason why I want to emphasize marketing and, you know, to build your reputation and brand, remember earlier on, I was talking about content and my experiences in content distribution production, but I was saying you could have awesome content if you don't have strong distribution, it's irrelevant, right? I said content is king, distribution is the queen. We all know who holds the real power in a household. And then I said, like, kind of context is the print. It's like the future. You take a given content, put it in a different distribution. It means a very different thing. Mein Kampf, which was Adolf Hitler's book, in an academic setting, it's fine. It's like you're looking at it historically. At a right wing uh, rally, it's propaganda, right? I mean, that's an extreme example, but it's the same content, different, two different distribution points, two very different contexts, two very different meanings. I may pass out soon with this mask, but it's okay. Um, and then, so you guys, when you're building your product, when you're building your service, when you're choosing the project, if you don't think of the marketing of how you're gonna get people to basically use this, find it, if you can't solve that, I'm telling you, you may as well pick another project. Yesterday in an actual meeting, my CTO, who I've worked with for, I'm sure you're gonna love me giving this example, Oh, by the way, let me give you another example after a call I had yesterday. Um, but to stay on track, my CTO, whom I've worked with for now pretty much 20 years and 15, 16 years at Watch Longo, he was like, you know, we should launch, take this technology that we have and build this project and basically compete with Patreon. Who here has heard of Patreon? So I'm like, Patreon? Yeah, I know Patreon. And I remember when like the CEO presented Patreon at like a conference like a decade ago. And it was like, no, no, it was a couple guys that built it a couple of years ago. I was like, I assure you, it wasn't a couple of years ago and it wasn't a couple of guys. It was like us, people think we're the overnight success. We've been at this for 15 years. But then I was like, okay, we are a B to C, a business to consumer media brand producing content. You want us now to become like a platform. Okay, who's, who's the team? How are we marketing this, right? The previous week, he was like, maybe we should take our technology, our content management system, and we should like open this up to other businesses. I was like, okay, so now you want us to become a business to business technology vendor? Who's the team? Are you going to be working two for seven? You know, I'm like, I want you to avoid burnout. I'm like, unless you have a team, unless you have a person, a project goes nowhere. So this is something you guys have to think about in our conversation the other night. There were four ideas, and I was like, it's not just a product. A product in a vacuum is irrelevant. It's the people, it's the marketing distribution, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I can't stress that enough, can't stress that enough, that when you are going to be given feedback from an investor, from an employee, from anybody, a bank, they're not actually giving you feedback on your idea and your project. They're actually giving you feedback on almost everything else. So the question? Okay, so the question for those calling in was, why not test those ideas instead of like on a limited budget? The, the second idea, the B2B software platform, the, the main competitors raised $90 million, nine zero US dollars. So about 115 Canadian, a buck 15, but 150 million. What is the small MVP that we're gonna do? We could take that. A few years ago, we, we had hired a bank we were exploring strategic options to sell raise financing. We spoke to Hearst. Hearst is like the New York Yankees and media company. We spoke to Ziff Davis. You know, they own a lot of brands, including IJ. They love the technology. I said, hey, would you license this? No. But if we bought you, we'd like to have the technology. So what you end up doing when you get into that software product game you know when you kind of see comparing product A, comparing product two, just check boxes, what, who offers what? You get into this kind of rat race where you're just adding products to try to meet, match the competition that unless you're really, really committed to it, 
you better not waste your time. It's the same thing that I said, unless you got two, three, four, five years to commit to something, who cares if you get three or four clients? You're just gonna have to serve those three or four clients. So it's more like, unless you have conviction, it's like when you look at a stock, when you buy a stock, unless you're a day trader and try to just make a quick buck, unless you have conviction to stay in that stock for three years, five years, 10 years, you're probably wasting your time. You know, So it's the same thing. We could test it on a small scale, but it's a distraction. It's like you're fighting, you're on this front, you're expanding, you're pushing into the enemy territory. Yeah, you could send two soldiers to go down this path, but they're, they're gonna get killed. Even when it comes to content, which is what people want from us, it's not like back in the old days when somebody watched CBC, BBC, ABC, and they knew that they might get a news show or they might get a drama or a comedy or a variety show, when you subscribe to a channel on YouTube, you want that formula. It could be vegan breakfast recipes. If all of a sudden there's like a greasy bacon sausage pizza, you're like, oh my God, I'm on subbing. Let alone if all of a sudden the guy starts to talk about fashion and military. So yeah, we have a free marketing, but if we just throw anything at our audience, they're gonna be like, what the hell is going on, right? So you still have to kind of be somewhat focused, right? Like in marketing, there's a concept of call selling. You go to RBC, you want a credit card, they might sell you a mortgage. Makes sense, but if you go buy a credit card and they're like, if we sell you the shampoo, which people offer me all the time, it's like, you're like, no, I don't want your shampoo, leave me alone, just give me a credit card, right? So you still need to be focused, but yes, in theory, trust me, I mean, we do this all the time. I go, give me your ideas, the crazier they are, the more happy I am. But it's not that the idea is bad. It's like, well, who's the team? And also, it's really hard to hire people. Yeah, I've invested in 20 startups, all of them without fail. Their number one challenge, anybody want to guess? Hiring people. So you too, when you're thinking of what project to pursue, I, I alluded to this earlier, think of who are the people that I'm going to recruit? Okay, so that's really, really important. Okay, yes, question. I agree. Okay, the question was about the feasibility of the idea, the feasibility of building the product. I mean, look, obviously, it's like you got to be able to build the product, ship the product. That is like number one. But I'm saying, even if you could build it, then it's like, how are you marketing it? How are you getting in front of the consumers? How are you going to hire the people to build it? But yes, I mean, these are all important gut checks. You know, one of the, the ideas that the group on Tuesday had, I told them it was a fantastic idea. There's a company that is doing this and they're trading at 80 times sales, not 80 times earnings. They're not, they don't have any earnings. It's a super promising company, but unless you have $300 million in venture capital, uh, you're not gonna be able to build that product, right? So yeah, you do need to think of the feasibility. So these are a couple of examples. Uh, anecdotally, um, who knows PewDiePie? You do know PewDiePie? It's like time flies. PewDiePie once in a while was the young next new thing. Now it's like I'm asking you if you guys know who like Wayne Gretzky is, right? Or who, know, who knows Mr. Beast? Okay, so you see like our world of YouTube, the cycles very quick. So once upon a time, the way that we kind of figure it out, wow, people like lists and we're passionate about it. PewDiePie, who is a Swedish YouTuber, sometime in the late 2000s, early 2010s, uh, was a gamer. So he realized like, hey, I could play video games and this let's play category is big. And to his credit, he clearly had the command of the audience and he knew how to speak and he had a sense of humor and yada, yada, yada. And he became, once upon a time, the most popular YouTuber with over 100 million subscribers. And um, in 2000, I think 17, I literally landed in LA at LAX, going back to Kelly for VidCon. And I check out my emails and I see my office is like going crazy. And I'm like, what is going on? And basically, uh, PewDiePie was roasting us. So, you know, in one of his videos, we had done top 10 PewDiePie videos, and he obviously made fun of us for doing that. But his opening line was, if you don't know Watch Mojo, you don't know Jesus. And he's like, you know, obviously he's roasting us. He's like, if you think I PewDiePie I'm running out of ideas, Watch Mojo is the king of running out of us. And I was like, this is it. I could retire. It's like literally you got Oprah Winfrey of our universe plugging you. So it was like cool. And to me, I just was reminding to my team, because somebody was like, oh, it's like, is he insulting us? I'm like, no, that's, that's, that's what you want. It's like a roast, right? It's kind of like, this is the, the, the YouTube universe. But I was like, look, guys, great work. You got the number one YouTuber in the world, basically 
calling you shout out, calling you out. It's all good in this case. Um, all PR is good PR. And it was like a little moment anecdotal, and you will have this. We had this the first time we noticed we had a Wikipedia page. I was like, oh my God. People know we exist, right? So there's going to be these little moments, and you have to savor them and enjoy them and cherish them because you know it's like Michael Dell says: you gotta, you know, celebrate all the little or big wins because you do get a lot of setbacks in life as well. And then a couple of years ago, um, Rebecca Brayton, who, if the Guinness Book World of Records would track who's done the more, most voiceovers in videos on YouTube. Rebecca would be probably number one. She's done like 90% of our voiceovers, but she's not seen in most of the videos. She's seen frequently enough, but you hear her voice and you hear her say, welcome to watchover.com today. We're going to count that. So she went to uh, LA for a junket. The new Spider-Man was coming out. Uh, that's Tom Holland, the Spider-Man, one of the three or four, who knows at this point. And, you know, he's just sitting there Actually, should we watch this? This is pretty. Have you seen this? Uh, I love watching Tom Jones. No. I'm always watching Tom Jones. Always. Watch Tom Jones. Yeah. Oh, no way. Oh, no. You never did this. Oh, my God. You know what I'm trying for us? I know. I mean, he's never done this in the show. Love him to watch Tom Jones. No way. So ridiculous. I love him to watch Okay. I mean, look, when you're building a media brand and you're covering this universe and Spider-Man is a fan, touch that. Like, that's it. Mic drop. I'm leaving. That's it. Bye. It was a great trip. I mean, that's what you're building for, right? So, yeah, very cool moment. And you got to kind of, like, plug your team. Does this show? This is pretty funny if I have the link. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, I'm talking, of course, about if you don't know Watch Mojo, that's like you don't know Jesus. And so it's like, you know, he goes on and it's like, I love it. And it's like when you are in this racket, this is what you want, right? It's a bit like if you are watching Jeopardy. And you're like, this channel, according to this channel, uh, Tom Cruise is the most, and it's like, what is Watch Mojo? You're like, oh my God, and that happens as well. So it's like, these are kind of things, they don't mean much. But my point is, this is what you're building for. I know it sounds weird. There is zero tangible value associated to it, but there is this crazy amount of intangible value. That is what goodwill is. Goodwill is brand equity. It's what you build for. You have to go after those moments. You can't just be kind of meat and potatoes guy. Um, okay. I've emphasized this quite a bit. I mean, Steve Jobs, I almost have to pay this guy royalties for how often I, I quote him, although I think Steve Jobs' uh, trust is, is quite you know, comfortable with, with their earning power. But the point is, this is a great line. He was really a sales guy. Um, Steve Wozniak, the other co-founder at Apple, was more of a technologist, if you're going to be fair. Steve Jobs was a great marketer, he was a great sales guy, he was a great storyteller. And this is really powerful that the most powerful person in the world is a storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come. So you guys have to tell that story. When you pick a product, if you can't tell a story to investors, to the press, to your future employees, again, you're going to have a hard time raising money, hiring, and selling your product. So it's got to be simple. And this decade, well, not really this decade, the previous decade, you saw this change, right? A decade plus ago, when I started to recruit a lot of communication, English, and journalism students, there was a lot of articles about how journalism is the most useless degree. And you know, you're you're hiring people and you want to build their confidence. And I would say, guys, this is BS. It's not true. Yes, there's a lot of people going to journalism. It's hard with the internet. Everybody wants to be a journalist. It's hard to find jobs, but it's not really true because telling a story, being able to take something and build a narrative around it is really, really going to be powerful, right? But the thing is, this applies to you guys as well in business. It applies to you in, in technology. It applies to all the fields. You have to be able to tell your story. There are some like kind of, I would say, lessons and rules of success. This is from like a presentation I made like five years ago. So I'm not sure if I would keep all these 10 in this order, but by and large, there are new rules, meaning it's not like before where like you kind of had a company and you called your PR person and the PR person would call 
you know, their contact at the Gazette or the New York Times and you had your story. I mean, nowadays with the internet, you kind of really, really, there's so much noise and clutter, you really have to kind of think in a very different way about how content is created, how content is featured. This is second nature to you guys. Um, but for those who are going to go work at a company, you know, not to use ageism, if your manager is a bit more senior, experienced, set in their, his or her or older ways, it's up to you guys to say, look, that might be the way, like, we might have done it a decade ago, but things have changed, right? And that's why I me, mean. you don't have a YouTube channel, you're creating a void, even as a B2B company, for somebody else to take your handle, have videos about your product directly, or the, the service you're offering. So you really, really have to start thinking right away, what is my presence on LinkedIn? What is my presence on YouTube? Should you be on Pinterest? If you're launching a service that reaches that demo, of course you should be on Pinterest, right? Second, uh, consumers have way more options than ever. You know, that's a good thing. Like I, I talked about glass stores, I mean, as much as I might have liked an L, I, as much as I may have disliked an element of it, overall, it's a powerful platform. It's a platform that empowers the downtrodden. I'll always root for those things. And it's the same thing. The internet, yes, it's crap on many levels, and there's a lot of bad things about it. But the internet, the best part is it just gives so much more power and options to consumers. Content is molecular. Right, like there is even your business plan, and this is how I've structured the grading. I said there's this visual image that you're going to have to create. There is this probably a press release that is kind of like more of a spiel about what you're offering. I said then you're going to create a video because that's going to kind of live on a different platform. Nobody's really going to go read your business plan, but the molecule that you're building that consists of all these atomic parts, those atomic parts could then go out there and do quite a lot of damage. The engagement is key, right? If you are producing content, whether it's for trade, whether it's PR, uh, again, that's my point. Like, it doesn't matter. I know my experience is in content, but if you're launching a product, content marketing is the future. The 30 second ad spot is not going to die, but you definitely can't rely on traditional advertising. So, how people react to your content is probably more important than what your content is. And you've got to serve an audience. If you are Home Depot, or here, if you are uh, Renault Depot, or if you're Lowe's in the US, those companies, I don't understand why they are not do it yourself, DIY powerhouses. They should have massive YouTube channels, massive like websites that give you everything about how to change a light bulb on how to build your deck and have like easy commerce and community that kind of like take you through, oh my God, I try to replace the sink in my kitchen and I made a mess and this is why, you know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a, it's a huge missed opportunity. Um, and frankly, that in of itself is a great opportunity to build up an agency that basically just focuses on content marketing and obviously those exist, but you could always do things better. Um, art and science, everybody uses art and science for everything they mentioned, but the point is yes, content creation, storytelling has been around pretty much forever. So, you know, there's always, what you are telling and then the data and the analytics that you need to actually dive into when i started watch mojo in the first month i was depressed because i would see okay our average video is like a minute but the average time spent on the website was like five seconds what would that tell you yeah the content sucks but what it was was i was like look we're creating a video on like travel to madrid and i'm buying a keyword on madrid but maybe most people are just you know, looking for air tickets or a hotel, maybe they've just made up their mind. So I need to go find people that are looking for, so you have to kind of mix and match. And then afterwards you kind of find your, your content distribution tool. Repetition and frequency. You've heard me repeat a lot of things. Unfortunately, my job at Watch Mojo is chief repeater. I have to repeat, actually no joke, your job as a founder CEO is repeating like one thing a thousand times to 10 different subgroups, stakeholders, over and over and over again. When my CTO, whom I love, whom I respect, all of a sudden we're in a forest, he's like, I'm gonna go wander over here. I'm like, there's a bear, the bear's gonna kill you. I'm gonna have to come get you, the bear will eat me. That's not good. Let's just stay together and stay focused. I'm repeating that every day to people that just wanna walk in all these random directions. You have to stay focused, you have to stay on message, you have to repeat, repeat, repeat. I'm not a patient person, but I've grown to be an extremely patient person. 
You know, every meeting that I have is an element in like self restraint. You want to tell people like that's a crazy idea. Like that's bad. We're gonna lose money. We're gonna lose our shirts. We're gonna get ridiculed. But there's a nugget of goodness in it, and you're basically just repeating whatever your vision is, whatever your mission is, for people to stay on focus and deliver. You make promises to your investors. You gotta deliver them before you go make new promises to people. You tell your investor you want to build a bridge. Deliver a bridge. It's that simple. It's really not that sexy. There's a lot of companies. Every day there's a press release. Every day is a new, like a lot of sizzle, no steak. Investors will not take you seriously. You got to deliver what you promised them, right? So repetition and frequency is required. Metadata is the beacon. If you are producing videos, or if you're producing articles, you can't just have a piece of content and put it out there. You need to describe what that is. Search engines do not, I repeat, do not actually index your videos. They literally listen to what you are telling them. Now, obviously, if I take this video and upload it and say this is a recipe for tuna sashimi, yes, people are going to find it, dislike, say this is a scam, this is clearly not what this is, then I will get hurt in the algorithm. But if you are describing your video well, you know, then people are going to find it and it's in line with what you want. YouTube, their famous algorithm, their brand safety is increasingly self-controlled. They actually tell you, um, they ask you, they're like, is there anything here that could be like violent, sexual? Are you like targeting kids? Tell us and we'll kind of give you the benefit of the doubt. And if you lie to us, we'll come down like a hammer over your forehead. And when you're bleeding, we'll roll you over with like a nice truck or something. I'm serious. And the people that mess with them, they just disappear from the web. Like, you know how the mob takes you and throws you in a lake or whatever? It's kind of like that, right? But so you need to describe your videos. It's all about, you know, it's all about how you, it's not what you do. It's almost everything you do around what you're doing. That's going to explain if you succeed or not. Patience and persistence. It is so normal for us to do something and then just wait for like the results. You know, it's like, or if you're, if you're driven by money, have your bucket out. If you're waiting for the investors, nothing will come quickly, especially content. Content is a long-term investment, right? And then finally, authenticity and credibility. PewDiePie succeeded for many reasons, but because he was a gamer. We succeeded at Watch Mojo for many reasons, but because I like researching things, ranking things, comparing things, and being somewhat objective and giving you kind of like, we all have biases, but I was like, okay, the internet does not need another opinion of something, but they do need something somewhat objective that says, hey, if you're looking to go to Europe, these are 10 great cities if you like architecture. It's gotta be authentic and credible. And you as an entrepreneur, you have to pick a project that makes sense. An investor wants to know like, what is that product person fit, right? And I said this to the other group, I was like, it's a great project, but unless one of you guys is so passionate about this that you're willing to commit 80% of your attention and energy for five years, you have no chance. Not that the idea is not good, but you don't seem to be that into it. Any questions on this? All right. So one of the assignments is basically to do um, a press release on your company or on your product. Um, really, really important. You have to be able to talk about, it's a bit, it runs counter to a lot of like, let's say Eastern culture and Eastern philosophies to talk about yourself and to brag about yourself or your company, but it actually is required. Nobody is going to on day one, come and brag about your great company or what a great founder you are. So I kind of want to take a hammer and break that kind of shield, that tendency we have to not be comfortable. I want to get you out of that. I want to put you in that comfort zone to be able to start doing that. I, growing up, read a lot of encyclopedias, don't ask why. And so I really like biographies. So I basically always end up writing biographies of people. Like I'm like my second book, Alexander the Great, we covered that quite a bit. But even my first book, Course of Success, it's like 300 short stories effectively of people and how they react in different situations. So I was always very comfortable to write about people. I remember when I was young, people would come to me and say, could you help me with my resume? I thought everybody had that skill, but I could take red and make it sound like cherry and people, it stood out. So you have to get into that 
comfort zone to be able to write positively about people, projects, things, because you need to stand out of the clutter. Okay, so moving along, that's marketing in a nutshell. Questions? We're good. All right, technology. Technology, look, technology as a standalone doesn't make sense anymore. Technology is everywhere. It's in everything. When I went to school, 96 and 99 at the school down the street, it wasn't, this was not the setup. You know what I mean? We had something like this, but clearly not even that high tech. Um, but I think there was a student here on Tuesday that was saying, well, there's going to be a lot of costs involved if I do this app to putting it on like the app store and the servers. And to me, it was like, oh, well, before you go out and spend a ton of money, let's just kind of look at where technology is. Look, in layman terms, a lot of what's happened in computer boils down for Moore's law, which is that computing power to dumb it down doubles every two years, right? Now, it is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you are Intel, Microsoft, Alphabet, Google, you set that as the target and you say, hey, I want computer chips that are twice as strong in two years. Or if you're Seagate or SanDisk, you're like, hey, we want storage devices that have twice the capacity that consumers could buy for the same cost in two years. So guess what? You go out and you buy the subcomponents, you hire people, and if that's your objective, then you're going to meet your objective, right? But nonetheless, it is true that computing power basically has doubled every two years. And I mean, the last time I read it, there's no end date to that. So my point is, today, whatever you're kind of thinking about, realistically, Think of in two, three, four, five years where the technology is going to be. Be aware, you know, we talk about technology debt, which is when you start coding something. If you don't fix the code along the way, you grow this technology debt that you have to then go and get rid of over time. It's the same thing with the platforms you choose. I've made many mistakes. We've all made many mistakes. Sometimes the decisions of like, We've actually been very lucky with avoiding bad software, avoiding bad, you know, uh, language, code languages. But it's also sometimes I'm like, man, if in 2006, we would have just used, let's say, YouTube's content management system. Yeah, we would have avoided a lot of headaches and heartbreaks and frustration from 2006 to 2011 when we tried to build our own CMS, for example. Because in the end, maybe it was overkill. We built it all on open source software, which is really, really powerful and it's changed it. And you guys would take this for granted now, but like when, when I started my career, it was kind of a novel uh, concept. And then the other thing is you could basically now, to your point, you can indeed start anything and build a minimal, minimum viable product on much less resources because of cloud-based <coughs> computing where your software, your hardware, all the applications are on the cloud. You don't actually need to pay much. So that should also come into your equation when you're trying to figure out what you want to do. I mean, look, the reality is there was a period in my industry. Um, there was a period in my industry where a venture capitalist more so than an angel investor, but even an angel like early stage, like pre-seed, would not actually invest in you if you did not have a strong partner who complimented you. So if you were the technical person, maybe they would take a leap of faith, but quickly they would surround you. They would say, well, we as the VC are gonna make sure you, you're set up administratively, corporate you know, files and everything is proper. It's premature to go hire a business guy, a sales guy, marketing, but it was very quick. But if somebody walked in and they had this great idea, but they were not technical, yeah, we saw that they're not going to fund you. They would say, okay, this makes no sense. You got to go find that. So yes, that is actually still true that you have to build a complementary team. That's very key. Don't actually ever, uh, look, I started the business with my spouse, but despite my many flaws and many crazy tendencies of crazy drive, crazy ambition, workaholic, sure, I actually can compromise and mainly I can pick and choose my battles because that's a one way road to divorce and destruction. If you start a company with your spouse and you can't compromise, like you have to be able to pick and choose the battles and divide and conquer. But set the spouse aside because that's a very unique balancing act. Uh, I could write a book about it. I practically my third book touches on a lot of that. But the main thing is don't go and start a business with your friend. Like 
you can and it can work but then understand one they will not really be your friend anymore in the sense of um you're going to start developing new friends almost hanging out with different people because you're not going to want to see the person socially friday at 7 p.m that you just spent the whole week building a business with. i assure you the last person you want to see is your friend in that scenario look i once in a while we'll invite the co-founders we all have young kids and we'll go on a trip to do something social every christmas i invite them over for a nice dinner i like to cook but it's once in a while i'm sure they don't want to see my face every friday night after like i even get out of their way like statistically i assure you yes there are cases that it works it's just it takes so much it's so much tension there's a lot of disagreement that it's just something i'm advising you to think clearly or just divide and conquer. Make sure you understand what the rules are. Don't get into an argument. Like my wife and I, we're not in the same meeting. It's not a coincidence. Because I go, even the staff would get tired if we're, because then they're like, not that we would be like this. They're like, why are they disagreeing? I feel like I'm at home with them. So we purposely go, okay, you take these meetings, I'll take this meeting. So it's like, we don't have that dynamic of a, it's a spouse that runs the company. Everything, there's a case. There is a case of like, there's a one-armed drummer, Jeff Butler. That's but most drummers are not one-armed. There was a blind guitarist, Jeff Healy. Jeff Healy, I think so. But most guitarists are not blind. Beethoven was deaf. You know, like I'm just saying there are these cases and they go on to greatness. Anything is possible. I understand the tendency to start with your friend. Hey. If I had a couple of people come to me and want investment and I saw they had chemistry, thumbs up. But in the back of my mind, I also go, I actually ask people in that scenario, oftentimes when there's two, like a, a clear co-founding unit, one of the questions I always ask, anybody want to guess what question I ask? What's given this theme? I go, how do you resolve disagreements? And if they disagree and I feel there's a fist fight at that moment, I'm like, okay, good, good mental note. But that's a way that I kind of get a sense of it's not a matter of if you disagree or if you misunderstand, it's when you disagree, when you misunderstand. Why? Because people don't listen to listen and register. They listen to counter, to get their two cents in. Human beings by nature, unfortunately, we are confrontational. I'm just telling you what 20 years of headaches and heartbreaks and hits and misses. So I'm saying do it. Obviously, it makes a ton of sense to start it with somebody you're comfortable with, but don't be naive about it. Have clear rules of engagement, have clear like parameters of who does what, and understand, okay, how do we resolve disagreements? Let's say you're at an impasse. That's it. But I agree that it's it's great. It's like great. Like the fact that my wife and I started the business, it was tough. But I love the fact that she shares in that success. And I, frankly, without her, I'd be face down in a back alley somewhere living in a refrigerator box. Like it's clear, she's a, she's a great compliment to me, but it worked because I was understanding that this could really not work and it would be really not fun if I lose the business and my relationship. So I'm just saying, don't go into it naively. Like I started the business when I hired a lot of like young kids out of school and I developed them into becoming like I treated them as partners and like peers and now they're kick-ass VPs so I have like so much experience in the industry. Great. They kind of took my lead. But imagine if like me and a guy that was a peer an equal like in terms of experience and all that started it. Well, yeah, it's not going to be like, sure, dear leader, take us to the promise land. We would have gotten many more debates. Like an early debate was, the guys were like, we shouldn't put the watch mojo watermark in every video. I was like, we're not making any money. We might as well get some branding. Thank God I just put my foot down because we ended up in the first few years getting billions of views and we got the watch mojo logo out there. But it's because ultimately, you know, they kind of defer to my. But imagine if we were like, no, yes, no, and then what, get into a fight over something relatively small. So I'm just saying conflict resolution could almost be its own pillar here. All right, so uh, anyone know what this is? It's a baby, that's correct, but what baby? Yes, very good, I'm surprised you know. How do you know that? <laughs> yeah, so in the late 90s, when the internet started, when the World Wide Web started, this was the thing. It was literally a dancing baby. I mean, if I click on it, it's just gonna dance. It doesn't do much more than that. You could read about it. 
There was a phenomenon released um, in 1996. There was a 3D character animation software product called Character Studio, which used 3D Studio Max. So it was somebody building a product and they did this as a proof of concept, I guess. This was a big thing. It was one of the first viral videos. It was the definition of frivolous. These days, what is the new trend? Three letters, everybody's talking about it. NFT, everybody's excited about non-fungible tokens. There is a lot of frivolous, downright possibly stupid, faddish, bubbleish parts of the NFTs, right? But it's not what it does now, it's what that could do over time. So years ago, there was an analyst named Mary Meeker, who would put out these like 700 page, you know, slides talking about technology. And then she went on to become a venture capitalist at Kleiner, very well known. And the fact that today I'm referring to Kathy Woods, I think, the fact that they're both women is really just a coincidence, but now Kathy Woods runs ARC and she does like, you know, she's like, Madame Innovation. She's always looking at like the future and like these key things. And she's kind of taken that baton. She had a very successful 2020. I mean, everybody who was investing blindly in 2020 was, was like, I had my portfolio made 7%, but it doesn't mean much because everything was up and to the right. But anyway, what's interesting is not whether you agree with her or not, it's how she breaks it down. So she kind of, and this is like, again, this is in vis-a-vis -vis your projects, if not now, and it's fine. The project you do in this class hopefully becomes the next Google, you know, and I would be very proud, but realistically, there's a chance that this project is like, you know, when I joke, I go, I, I, when I used to work at a pizza restaurant, yeah, the first time they gave me a piece of dough and they said, make a pizza, and nobody ate that pizza. It was not like edible, it didn't make sense. It was, you know, so I'm just saying, this is like a, a little experimental sacrificial baby in some ways that you're doing, but it's important to think of these key things. Look at the attributable enterprise today. You see those circles getting bigger from 10 billion to 100 trillion. You know, blockchain right now, by the looks of it, is like a hundred billion or trillion dollar industry, but blockchain will grow to be a hundred trillion by the estimate in a decade. Um, you know, 3D printing right now is a, apparently, a, let's call it a $50 billion market. It's going to become a $10 trillion market, right? So it's important, again, to see where the technology goes and not see it for what it is. For, frankly, when I heard the 3D printing, I was like, what the hell was that? Like, is this like a papier mache? And then I realized what 3D printing was. So I'm just saying it's easy to be cynical. It's easy to doubt things and ridicule things. But you do need to kind of like start to pay attention to what these trends are which ones are going to grow, and then which one based on the environment, your skills, your comparative advantage, your passion points, which one you should be paying attention to. In my little universe of like content, again, if somebody came to me and said, I want to launch a YouTube channel, I'm like, think of TikTok. It's cluttered, but even think of the next TikTok, right? So you do need to see where the puck is going, not where it's been. And then this also break it, breaks it down really, really well. Um, like robotics, I invested in a, um, it's called Your Personal Chef, YPC. It's like, food automation, right? They basically are putting these machines that can cook food without chefs in like residential um, buildings. What I like about it is I said, yeah, because of a lot of trends, there's gonna be a demand for this the same way that car manufacturing used robotics, but that's gonna go from a $168 billion market to a $10 trillion market, right? Blockchain is going to go from a trillion dollars to 50 trillion. Um, AI, 10 trillion to 100 trillion. So you have to kind of like map this out. You want to ride, find the waves and not be pursuing yesterday's battles. So one of you brought up digital wallets, you know, and I said that's a great opportunity. And I wanted to show this to go look, it is a great opportunity. But again, it's very competitive. There's a lot of companies pouring a lot of money. Is that really the best kind of battlefront for you? And then Web3, which means a lot of things I know we discussed it, um, you know, does allow for a lot more to happen if instead of you like logging in with your email and then having to log into PayPal to buy something, like imagine how much Amazon's one-click buy changed how much more crap you buy. 
Now imagine if when you log in, your identity is basically tied to a wallet and everywhere that you go, it's kind of encrypted and eventually like kind of like logging in became a lot simpler either with your fingerprint or your like iris scan or face recognition, whichever, right? So my point is, again, you guys, if you're younger, you should be taking a lot of this for granted. You're like, this who's talking about this? Like it's novel, but this is like, this is the present. So my point is, you absolutely want to be playing in these sandboxes or, or, and this is a big opportunity, take these trends and apply it to more traditional things. Uh, there's an investor, John Ruffalo. Uh, he actually sadly got into a bike accident. Uh, he was biking and a, a truck hit him and he's paralyzed from the waist down. And that's why when I got hurt, I was like, you're such an inspiration. I was like, that's one of the 80 reasons I'm not complaining because I like, this is nothing compared to what you had. Um, anyway, he now raised a big fund. He was one of the first investors like in Shopify, right? So he's kind of a legend in Toronto for, for investing in a lot of these big industries. But so he's kind of like raised a ton of money, I think 500 million, yeah, $500 million to invest in companies that are disrupting traditional industries. And that's gonna be a bigger, bigger thing because all these tools um, are gonna disrupt traditional far more than necessarily create new questions. No. So the point is use technology to peer into the future. And there was a period where it was like really, really, really smart programmers and engineers and developers were really building on, I thought myself, I was guilty of this, a lot of frivolous things. But the reality is like, whether it's personal computers, open source, decentralized internet protocols, the movements, they're not solutions to near-term problems, but like use technology to peer into the future and use them to build something that actually will stand the test of time in a few years. Okay, um, where are we? Okay, so we're almost done and then uh, we'll open it up if you guys have questions because I think the Tuesday session was really constructive. I know there's a group that wants to talk uh, afterwards privately, which is fine. Product and service. So product and service really, you got to think of all these things before you pick a product, whether it's the research and development, whether it's literally researching the market size or developing it, either way, you got to think of that quite a bit. Then just like describing what is the product, what is, what is it tangible, is it not? The manufacturing and production is key. In my life, I've seen a lot of great ideas. And then when we sit down to go, okay, how is this being built? What is the production look like? The person disappears. So I'm like, okay, there's no conversation. It's the project management. Who's managing this? Who's making sure that things stay on time, budget? Like in your group, somebody needs to be, you know, make sure the trains leave on time. Market research, focus groups, eh, it's important, absolutely. But it's like, it's inversely important to, no, actually it's directly correlated to how expensive the R&D and setup costs are. Don't go out there and build, anybody here watch The Simpsons, Homer's car? which was like a very convoluted car that nobody wanted with like 15, and I'm aging myself. But the point is, make sure you're not building a, a, a better mousetrap that nobody asked for. You gotta actually take a bit of time to ask people. But at the same time, I'm gonna caveat that with what Henry Ford, admittedly a Nazi, so I don't wanna quote him too much, but like Henry Ford once said, if I asked people what they wanted before building my car company, they would have said, who knows the answer? Faster horses. So, you know, if I would have told people in 2006, what kind of video content you want, people might have said, you know, that cool dog video on a skateboard, it's kind of grainy. That could be like in high definition. I was like, yeah, I could, but what about this super cool video about whatever else that's research and looks like what you watch on Discovery Channel, but like not that much fluff, right? So you kind of have to be a bit outside thinker. And then really key, like to be able to pivot, right? Like if you're doing something and you're just digging and digging and digging, you can't pivot, you're probably gonna be dead before you even blast off. We did not at Watch World go pivot and get out of content and say we're a platform. But without a doubt, we pivoted in terms of what we were producing. We were basically producing at first cooking videos and how to's, and then in the end we're producing like top 10 lists on Batman villain. So yeah, we did pivot, but not, in the, and then the whole, okay, so a few years ago, everybody was like, fail fast, hashtag. It was like, people were like bragging about how much they suck. And I was like, okay, here, I wrote the book on my failures and how like we succeeded because we ran out of ways to succeed. But I'm like, in the end, 
you have to win. Like, let's drop the kumbaya, let's hug it. You, it's competition. You, you have a good idea, you share it with somebody. Yeah, they're not here to make your dreams come true. They will take that idea and do it every day of the week, twice on Sunday, unless there's a reason they think you add value. And it's the same thing when you're kind of discussing ideas. Yeah, it's great. And, you know, we want everybody to kind of have touch the puck once and touch the ball once, but you got to score. You know, and that's something that like young, I have two young daughters. I teach them a bit about resiliency. You know, they're not too young to hear about envy and jealousy and people's pettiness. I'm not painting a rosy picture. There's this great video um, of like, it's linked, it, I saw it on LinkedIn, but it's basically like the end of a marathon and these two ladies are holding their hand to win together. And there's this, uh, it actually is more symbolic. It's two white women that are like running, holding hand. And there's this black woman who's just running, 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 and she beats them. And the, the line was everybody on LinkedIn about how it's not a race and me hustling. Yeah, it's a competition. It's a competition. Sometimes it gets a bit dirty, unfortunately. There are rules. I'm wearing my mask. You respect the rules. You don't cheat. You don't lie. You don't cut corners. You're exposed. The sunlight will expose the liars, cheaters, and thieves. You don't want to be that, but you're here to win. The venture capitalist you're talking to does not care about you. They don't even care about your product or your service. But to be clear, you are a number in a portfolio. What you end up doing for them in terms of a financial return is the only thing they really matter. Yes, they're going to say the right things on Twitter and the hashtags, and they're going to show that they care about diversity. They do not care about that as much as they care about their return. And any investor that tells you otherwise is a liar. And I love the fact that I could say that, and they're not going to be too hurt, and they're going to privately say, he's right. They have LPs. They will also say, we're fiduciaries. We have LPs, limited partners, investors. So you guys have to be very realistic if you want to go down this rabbit, which means you got to be able to stay agile and pivot. Otherwise, you're dead. And so this is an earlier point. The only way we succeed as a group is not simply following directions, but it's in keeping each other accountable for our actions. I have an anonymous town hall form that I give to every employee. I'm like, you can email me confidentially and sign off your name if there's a problem of any kind. I mean, two problem or like a copy stuff. It could also be anonymous. You could say, Ash, you're an idiot. I need to hear that. But it's also to make sure that it keeps everybody honest. And thankfully, we've never had any issues because people like don't tolerate that kind of nonsense. But it's the same thing where you don't want to surround yourself with people that have an excuse for every potential problem. You want to be around people who deliver, people have solutions. It is a state of mind. It's like athletes. We see it all the time. There's a guy who's taller, it's got a stronger arm. Tom Brady, greatest quarterback of all time, guess which round he was drafted in? Six, right? So it's more about a state of mind. You want to surround yourself with winners. You want to surround yourself with people who are students, per perpetual students of an open mind, because there's going to be a lot of things you get wrong, right? Don't be blown away by, I'm ironically saying this in the deal, um, don't be blown away by like the fancy, fancy degree, last name, pedigree. You know, it's why I like soccer. You wear a jersey, you're all equal. And that's what you need to hire to the best of your abilities. Take it from Elon Musk. Designing the manufacturing system is 10 times to 100 times more difficult than designing the product. Absolutely. Watch Rojo in our own little bubble. I hated the whole, everybody always told me content does not scale. Watch Rojo does not scale. True, compared to a lot of things, but we won because we built a model. We built a model that could replicate and stand the test of time. I was not interested in building one viral video. I was interested in building a dominant content.